Our next talk is about fun with electronics development. The assumptions that people make, uh, the traps you can fall into, because, well, that's the way you've been doing it all the time. Maybe you've done some copying and pasting from other projects. The Those 100 nano always go in there, and, and then suddenly we wonder why there are electric impulse problems and all that. We have a speaker that can talk about exactly that, and that's Luki. Please, a warm welcome to Luki and his expertise, and have fun. Right, hello. I'm glad that some people are here. First question, are there hardware developers present, professional ones? OK. I hope that there was something for every one of you. I had to mix it all quite from different kinds of levels of, of difficulty. Let's start with something simple, resistor, resistors. You know these, you have many of them on your board. Now, two things will be appearing across this whole talk. First, do you really need this? Second, is this really correct? So, this resistor has 4.223 kilo ohms. It would be no more, more regular if you would be using standard values. You've saved a lot of hassle if things get cheaper. You could perhaps choose the same value as some other resistor on the board. Yeah. Second item. Is it actually true? No, it's not. That resistor will not have 4.223 kilo ohms. There are uh, uh, there are ranges, there are tolerances, there are things that can damage a resistor. There are all kinds of things you have to look out for. Uh, there are loss, uh, power losses, which are becoming more and more important, not just because boards have to use little power, but mostly because small resistors, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, can actually take surprisingly little. And in case of something goes wrong, you can easily have something going up in smoke. 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0.2 things normally have to milliwatts, which is very easily reached. Um, very quickly, because this is where makers often make errors. Uh, there are pull-up resistors that you can that you have in modern boards, but these are quite imprecise and can vary from one charge from from one batch to the other. Thirty to sixty kilo ohms often is not enough to keep a signal going easily, cleanly. Um, if a resistor is really important, you must never rely on the built-in pull-up resistor in the microcontroller. If it's not that important, an external thing, if it's not that important, if it's important, better have something external that you can control better. A uh, small detail, a uh, marginal detail. Who? Someone has very good microcontrollers that are very precise and 4.7 kilo ohms takes you quite a distance. So what do you do with resistors? For example, you can very nicely measure current, which can be precise, cheap and quite easy. What happens though in practice with a setup like this? The resistor has to be connected somehow, and, and, and these connection resistances, if you choose a small measurement resistance, they can be significant. The normal approach here is uh, for, for terminal measurements. So you take care that the measuring and the um, power is at different rails. You can have really good and expensive uh, resistors in there, or, but you can also use different resistors. I've got some uh, knowledge about that. If you want to, you can come later. To Capacitors Those are the next important. Um, uh, uh, capacitors, I think, is the word. Everybody knows them. And this is the real capacitor. It's, it's not different than the one you can see on the uh, drawing board. Depending on which tool you use or which uh, distributor you use, 
those other elements are smaller or bigger. And you always, if it's not a really uncritical device, think about what does my uh, um, what does it do it for example higher frequencies it may happen that it's really small and the resistor that is in series to it is quite big or it make um, it may oscillate with the capacity which is also there that is not only a problem with um, that, but every real device has a, other elements inside, parasitic elements that are just there. Especially important, uh, surprisingly, is the uh, diodes between gate and drain with MOSFETs. However, I have the good experience to just put it into the um, paper, uh, the, the, the schematics, and I will. You notice that, and you will see that there are these powers that go through it, and you will see it. With the resistors, there is, depending on how it's built, sometimes significant inductivities. So, a uh, normal resistors mm, is an uh, unusable. Um, at 300 megahertz. With inductivity, it's uh, important how they are built. Um, inductivities where they are um, wound, it's often significantly. One practical example for the uh, uh, capacitors, huge cap um, microcontroller with ca capacities, so in it, every VCC connection an additional bypass capacitor is needed. So someone said, with the 15 nanofarads could be complained with a other capacitor. So it started, everything worked, and then it started making errors. Someone looked at the errors at the software, and everybody expects the errors in the software, but no, it was the hardware. Small talk about. Why do we need capacitors? Why uh, bypass capacitors? Why are they important, and where we aren't we forget them? On the board, there's also free and hidden um, elements. In the uh, trays, there are also some inductivity uh, and capacity to the ground or to any other um, line in the university. Sometimes you can just, they are negligible, but the one that's right next to it mustn't be neglected. With, I hope, I can expect that I don't have to explain that CMOS microcontrollers and others integrated circuits are de facto only use power while moving or while changing state. So at short, short periods they need a lot of power and after that not that many. They need it, they have to come from somewhere. The big electric gap are far away so bypass capacitors are needed and the bypass capacitors have to be close. The great hint that has already moved a lot of problems is first of all after placing the ICs put the caps as close as possible put it there a big line and with every bypass capacitor gets two its own vials that are not shared with anybody one to ground one to VCC and you have to do that with every one in this case it was done and the problems were the capacitors is important. It's in this case the capacitor is one microfarad. It's not with the base tolerance that's always there. Condensators of ceramics are depending. Uh, the capacity is dependent on the uh, voltage. 
the important is the higher the uh, the smaller the device is and the higher the voltage sometimes just 20 percent of the ordered capacity can be actually used so one microfarad the capacitor has with one volt bias voltage that is quite difficult to get those information it's some, usually not in the data sheets but the uh, manufacturers offer own data sheets. If the manufacturer does not offer this information, choose a different manufacturer. A small thing, uh, of course. Uh, with ceramic capacitors, there are three letters at the end. What do they mean? It means something about the temperature and the how, uh, how stable it is about the temperature. The less you pay, the worse it gets. The most the grail are CG uh, oh, oh, zero. They are not dependent on the temperature, but you don't get anything bigger than one nanofarad. So you can't use them as um, bypass capacitors, but as filters, they you have to use that. Also interesting. I would also. I also had to learn it the hard way. Ceramic capacitors are ceramics. Ceramics ca breaks easily, and if you don't care, uh, then small um, fr uh, fractures appear. I unfortunately don't have an image of that, but through the small cracks, um, uh, moisture enters the device, and that is not good with electronics. Another battery problem. The battery has that many milliampere hours. That is not really good. No. The effective way is, as always, after the tolerance is with batteries, especially not how f uh, the temperature and f with how much power you uh, use them. The more uh, uh, amps you take out of the battery, the smaller the capacity gets. So the 2,600 milliampere hours are uh, only valid if you take a certain current, but you'll never use that. You'll always be above that or below that. So if you have a, a device with batteries and you design it, there you have to test that. Only with the data sheet, you don't get any more information. Now, large topic, data sheets. The data sheets, the data sheet says, well, the data sheet unfortunately is written by humans as well, and humans make errors. That can happen. So if you have a data sheet, open up. First of all, look if these people made errors. Are there any known errors? Are there some corrections? Uh, the, the editing history could be important. Uh, that will tell you what has been changed and corrected. Now, next interesting part, typical. Uh, on the first page, uh, you have the typical details. Typical means, unfortunately, nothing but we would like it to be that way. Yeah, well, if you think about it a bit and read the footnotes, you will no notice that you will get some really nice answers. Typical means non-tested. So the only thing that has been tested with an integrated circuit are the min and max. Now, these are hard pass and fail tests. If the circuit is supposed to work reliably, uh, even next week, you should uh, keep inside these min and max and worst case scenarios. Uh, now, n the absolute maximum ratings, because more and more frequently I've seen circuits where the microcontroller was operated with six volts, because it says in the data sheets absolute maximum, yes, that is allowed. No, you are not allowed. Absolute maximum ratings means if you keep below that, nothing should happen. If you if you just exceed that even with one value shortly, short amount of time, something may happen. We don't know. Maybe nothing bad. Maybe it will fail immediately. So avoid maximum ratings. Electrical characteristics is the right page to use. That is where you should look if you are going to operate your IC. Another nice story. On the first page of a data sheet, the FED 
can switch 429 amperes. Wow, five pages further on. Well, yeah, well, the Fed can, but the the casing uh, it can, it can't really manage to 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 carry more than 160 amperes. Uh, so what's meant is the Fed's own temperature, and if you don't take care and uh, include lots of cooling devices, things can get really hot. And this is from a, on, from an Arduino motor sheet. There was a driver on that uh, that said, I can do 50 amperes, and that's what it was sold for. Yeah, well, at room temperature, optimum cooling, um, the, uh, the the pin bar can do three amperes per pin, and 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 the um, connection the connection can do twenty. So the the motor has nothing to do what you can expose the whole device to. So diodes. Um, these diodes have just half the kind of loss that typical diodes have. So. Um, VCC, clean 5 voltage, and nothing else. How much is VX? 5 volt? 0 0.5? Who's, who, who will offer more? Well, it depends on the temperature. Schottky diodes have a temperature-dependent blocking current. If you heat the, the tool uh, thing, uh, it can happen that 10 milliampers in the wrong direction, where you could normally mean the uh, diode should block that, maybe these will go through. So you get a nice little uh, voltage uh, gradient there. And if you then are supposed to start a USB application or something, you'll have lots of fun. The 12 volt board on board network in the car, always an interesting, interesting story. Yeah, well, it's not 12 volts actually, never. First of all, a 12 volt uh, lead battery has 13, or if it's fully charged, 14.4. Um, if it's nice and cold in the car and you start the car, this will fall to something like 6 volts or even less. So, um, Below that, below that, everyone is afraid because the light machine won't work at that. But on the other hand, 120 volts may be too much, but 60 uh, volts does happen. There are relays there. There are a lot of um, um, many issues, and it's not stable. So the Americans have everything bigger, and if the battery is empty, the start help of the LKV may be used with 24 volts. If the battery is used for 12 volts, it will not start. And reverse battery, yeah, it may happen that you put in the battery the wrong way around. And it's not if it's not protected against uh, the reverse voltage. It's bad. Another thing with the car. A car means two, minus 40 to 125 degrees. That's Celsius. Celsius. That's wrong. The NEC has different grades, limits. In the worst case, it goes to 140 volts, and if you have move it to the gearing or the motor, that may not be enough. But usually, grade three to minus 40 degrees to over 85, it will probably not reach that high. All that's interesting with temperature range, look at what it's mean with that. Surrounding temperature, building temperature, or the never measurable junction temperature. So, the temperature of the silicium inside the device. Usually it's ambient or case temperature, but look at it or ask about it. All right, another secret, uh, the inverting um, bias current. If you uh, 
All right, you have, you have seen the schematics. It really happens with real old op controllers without integrated input bias compensation. The input bias power of operational is quite big, so they developed an, uh, a, a devices that they don't need that much. It's not perfect and not the same well on plus and minus, so it may happen that suddenly there is no power going into the operational uh, in the, but on the outside and that's different on plus and minus. So with modern options uh, operate, uh, you should change to use a different one because the bias power is um, the specified as plus and minus, but it's standard and the trick is still there, but it will probably not work. Operational, you're getting better and more stable. They and you can put a couple of picofluorates into the bag, it doesn't immediately start to oscillate, but you can't trust that. Always check. The easiest way is if you put in a jump in front of it, and with not really scientifically correct method, you look at how the exit um, overshoots, and if the overshoot is smaller than 30%, you can say the phase version is less than 45 degrees, that's okay. It doesn't always move, uh, work, but it is practical and it's quite easy to measure. To notice these errors beforehand, operations have another imp uh, important specifications, the gain battery, um, but so the bandwidth. So if you have a gate, 50 megahertz gate bandwidth, you put a 100 kilohertz sign signal in the entry, and it's configured as a buffer, so at the outside, other side, it should be exactly the same signal. No. Gain bandwidth product is a small s signal um, um, uh, happening. If the signal is big, the slew rate may happen. The slew rate means how much the output can do. In this case, the output cannot follow the output signal sufficiently fast, and the sign goes into a, a triangular wave. Active filters, probably everybody knows them. Uh, to calculate them by hand, it's not that easy, but there are uh, tools to do that. So let's build something like that, and the same op, op gain uh, with the same gain bandwidth product. But at a couple of kilohertz, something happens. What what does what happens there? So no. has something to do with the frequency dependent output impedance of the operation. So you build a voltage divider with C2 and R2 parallel to R1. That means the filter does not uh, it works to a certain frequency like it's supposed to, but after that frequency, it's, uh, the, the reduction is reduced. Rail to rail means from minus VCC to plus volt VCC, or from zero volt to VCC. No, that's wrong. Until to the real edges, it will not work, and how close you get to zero volt or VCC is important to the uh, amount of power taken and the temperature. Uh, additional, if you have to choose between uh, operational amplifier with that's defined to rail to rail and uh, classical the rail to rail one according because of the significantly more um, uh, expensive output is 
always less detail, uh, less exact than a classical one. In this graphics, you can also see quite clearly the maximum possible out, uh, output um, amperage or voltage. So, so operational amplifiers can also be used as comparators is the next myth. Have the same symbol so they could be used interchangeably. This is what people like to do, is that allowed? No. Uh, you should really don't not do that because the uh, exit stages of a comparator are completely differently built and the input uh, stages as well. So every, every device for its own purpose. The comparator, use one if you need a comparator and if you, use an, if you need an operational amplifier, use that. The next large category are the instrument amplifiers. And these amplify the voltage difference of the inputs uh, by a, ch a choosable or fixed value. Is that true? Yes, well, they do, but there is a very important graph in the data sheet, which is the diamond plot um, because of the shape, and it says in which voltage area the range the inputs can be for it to function properly. And there are some severe restrictions, and you really have to read through this carefully and take care how you use them. An analog digital converter, it will be actually a topic for a separate talk of its own. Uh, SR analog digital converters uh, are very widely spread and are almost always connected the wrong way because there are no high resistance inputs here. What happens is that uh, the sampling capacitor uh, is switched to the input and that will then load itself up from the voltage that is actually supposed to be measured. And, but but that current, that, that charge has to come from somewhere to, to load up the capacitor. So if you, there are no filter capacitors used, the voltage you're supposed to measure will break down and you measure less than you actually want. So always use an RC filter in front of the input of a microcontroller. Um, converter. And next function is, of course, anti-aliasing and so on uh, has to always, you have to keep to that. So some kind of product will be advertised by saying we have a 24-bit analog digital converter here, hugely expensive. Can, you can actually, it can well happen that a similar product, <coughs> which has a well-adapted uh, but only 12-bit ADC, will actually provide better output than a very expensive 24-bit ADC. The resolution at, with ADCs is, not, is only one of the important criteria. Um, it can be very elaborate and a very elaborate task to treat an ADC correctly and set it up correctly and, and the components around it choose those correctly. This will now follow us through a certain number of slides because it's an, an important thing. Very shortly, what is precision? What is um, exactness? What is stability? Precision uh, was known as repetition precision. I am measuring a value several times, and I could expect, by, if I'm measuring the same values several times, I would expect the same value to come out. Otherwise, you have bad precision. Exactness, uh, I measure a value, and I would expect that value to be correct. But statistic tells us that you can never know the exact value. You can only approach it as far as you want. And and um, 
the stability I, I will measure at different times now, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, I want the same value to come out. Well, these three conditions should be pr exactly specified. You should know what you want. Do you want a precise uh, um, circuit? Do you want a, a, an exact one? Do you want a stable one? Do you want a combination of those? If you want that, you have to invest a lot of time and money for development. The main problem with ADCs are the reference voltage sources. Even with very expensive reference voltage sources, you will have problems. For example, a 16-bit ADC, uh, to, to, to supply this adequately with the reference voltage, you just have to look at the specifications. If the temperature changes by one degree, uh, with these, um, well, LT 1019, top of the line, the normal reference voltage source, but uh, if one, if the temperature changes by one degree, the uh, the voltage will change by 10 ppm, which is about as much as one bit of a 16-bit ADC. So 16 bits precision, it will be very hard to reach. You have to use very elaborate, very very sophisticated reference voltage sources. So don't let yourself be blinded by the bit number stated for an ADC. The reference voltage, the temperature dependency is not linear, by the way. If it were, it would be easy to, to factor it out, but it won't work that way. Right, let's come to something different. The temperature stated with lots of digits behind the decimal point. Well, temperatures with more than 0.5 degrees precision, measuring those is very, very hard. It's actually it's not serious to state a temperature with several pla digital uh, decimal places, um, because that is no normally not reachable. A very important point here, a temperature sensor will always measure its own temperature. It will not measure the temperature that you want. It will measure its own temperature. That can be a different thing. Oscilloscope um, sensors are a very popular uh, source of error. You have a 10 mega ohm um, you know what, what an, an oscilloscope has says and it sounds like it's a real high resistance however it is and can sometimes just not be that high resistance oscilloscope test um, Yes, are have a, usually a problem with the capacity. There is, however, an easy trick that sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. If you have a really small signal with an, and try to connect it with an oscilloscope, just put another connector onto the same uh, trace and look if the other is exactly the same signal. If it changes by adding a second connection, you can expect that the first connection has already made an error and you should use different methods to measure the signal. Don't forget the uh, connection has to be con um, has to be ch checked several times uh, as frequently. So you have to recalibrate it often. often. The mass and uh, connection is a really well-known um, error um, measuring. And you never know whether that's from the signal, does it come from somewhere else, is it really there? With the connector there's a small plastic bag, there's a small tip there, you usually lose it, but uh, the 
a paper clip you can uh, make a re uh, in a uh, test so you have a really significantly smaller area to the ground so you have to make sure that you don't make any um, short, uh, short circuits on the T. So back to the electromagnetic chip. It happened before the speed of a signal is usually absolutely irrelevant. Sometimes it is about the time, uh, the rise time. The rise time of five nanoseconds is usual for slow CMOS, like like uh, nearly every microcontroller. If you uh, uh, switch, you put up a errors with significant frequency parts far over 70 megahertz. So the repeat rate, the frequency of a signal is not important. The rise, rise time is important. However, it's another huge topic and I was told I will be thrown from the stage if I'm not ready after one hour. So, um, it, um, yeah. power supplies. So, an output sh a 9 volt device should run uh, at 9 volts. It, if they are used with little um, uh, power, they sometimes have a significantly higher voltage. And that sometimes can break your device. So, if it's not a controlled Voltage supply, be careful. If we have a bus converter, that step, a step up converter, and it says it can do one amp output power. It, well, not the output power, it's not the maximum input power, it's the maximum output power you can calculate with this formula. And it also includes the um, inductive um, current. current. So you also have to calculate that. It's, you should use calculational tools for that. Don't use it. But don't calculate it by hand. Another thing: step-up converter have to be significantly overdimensionated. How does it work in practice? How do you look at it realistic with the well-known old um, free additional parts? Uh, Step-up converter are usually a big fan of the pro uh, with, with problems and usually it's one of those if there's a problem. So, put it directly behind the uh, bypass capacitors. capacitors and clearly lay out it, look at the components really carefully, especially the loop where a lot of current is flowing. It has to be minimized. That isn't always easy, but you should do your best to reduce that. So, I have seen too many projects where new layout was needed because the uh, converter had too many problems. So, because it's so funny, you usually need more than one voltage. So, you need several voltage uh, step up converters. So, sometimes or usually there is a B frequency effect. So, there are frequencies there. So even the same voltage uh, step-up converters are usually not uh, running at the same frequency. They usually have in the effect slightly different frequencies and you get a beat frequency. Sometimes uh, step-up converters have a frequency that the uh, functions that you can uh, synchronize them. You connect them with each other with a pin and they all run at the same frequency, but that only works when they offer this option. They do not offer this option. You have to uh, decouple every uh, step-up converter from every other. So, have significantly uh, distance between them to not have capacitive induction and put the, make them large, have a large enough input um, capacitors.
and then it says yes. I don't care about the uh, if the bank incumbent converter has some problems. I just put a low dropout regulator in front of the difficult um, uh, uh, small components, and it will just remove the issues. Um, the problem is the it is supposed to do that. In theory, it does so. The power line projection ratio is depending on the frequency of the uh, and how much um, voltage drop is accepted over it. LDOs nominally look like linear controls or converters, but they can get unstable if they're not connected to the right capacitors at the output. And interestingly, LDOs need a certain amount of serial resistance to, to, to remain stable. So the resistance that's built in is actually um, Oh. Low inductivity is actually a mechanical thing that oh, you can't get the polarity wrong, but you can link it wrongly. Um, so beginning and end should always be where the most dirt in an electronic sense happens on the side that's not filtered. That's where the beginning of the coil should be. Uh, that's why inductivity uh, is marked with a dot there. And uh, uh, just a small insertion, um, the reverse current normally takes the, the path of least impedance, not the path of least resistance. Um, so with higher frequencies, the uh, reverse current will more and more approach the first the, the initial path the why is that important well it can be very important there's the old hint there just put everything connect everything to ground and then the the, the current will find it, it's very, the right path good idea but you should not just simply fill everything with ground but uh go through go after each signal and uh avoid mass peninsulas and uh, and uh, it, if you just fill in with ground without care uh, and not look at the way those areas are then shaped uh, and if they sometimes can couple over signals yeah another myth is that 90 degrees angles must be used in uh, on uh, boards that's and with a lot of measurements, you see, there is absolutely no problem with it. There is. And sometimes with real high frequency, which is, that's a bigger problem. With high um, angle angles, it may be a problem, but only with the print production. So they may be so. Use re rectangular lines at no really is fine. So the 50 ohm breaker line is a couple of millimeters, is 0.4 millimeters wide. You have calculated that. If that value is really critical, you should tell it to the um, uh, platine. Uh, the manufacturing house because only he knows exactly how f thick it should be. If it's important or if not, it's about your project. So, how a lo lot of components you can sometimes have problems that with the vibrations they fall down. So, you should stick it, but never with silicone. Not with hot glue, it just doesn't work. And second, and some other uh, cyanide acrylate uh, doesn't look nice, but you have to stick it to it, but with the right material. Several people think I've made this great um, connection, Circuit. nobody must rework it, and uh, so I pot it. 
but usually you can just depart it with a lot of patience. So, my board is ready. I have thought about that a lot and I heard it quite often, but have you really thought about all components? Is it they are is there a possibility you can get them? Are there fiducials? Are the wires close enough to the pads? Or do they overlap? There has been a problem before. No, don't put any uh, solder resist onto the ears. Bias. That will only lead to errors. Have you good um, physical connection holes? The 3 millimeter is not possible uh, good to connect it with screws. If you have on the board uh, plates for the serial number, have you thought about that everything has to be soldered? Have you thought um, about rechecking it with a different uh, program that it works uh, so, uh, before you send it to the manufacturing house? Sometimes there are errors. Are the um, uh, are there is there enough space? For, uh, can you really screw in the six uh, lot without making problems? So you get the device and you can't open it and it doesn't run. So you look at with the thermal camera onto it and you see, ooh, something happened down there because 36 degrees is not wrong. The problem is. It was not connected. It, the thermal camera just was used wrong. Thermal cameras are really great. You can have a lot of fun with them. Like uh, the colleague who uh, photographed me while soldering. But you should know what you are doing and take some um, precautions. No flux doesn't have to be removed. It's only clean. That's Soldering directly in touch with it. We can also talk about that. But first to no clean. What does no clean mean? No chemical aggressive or um, conducive uh, reducement. So they still may be uh, sticky, so liquids or um, dust may collect there and it leads to problems. So if you have something to do with small voltage, uh, small currents or high voltages, you should also remove the non-clean flux. So crimp connections, we better solder additional so that it really works. Yes, no, better buy a good crimping uh, tool and the proper uh, um, uh, crimps so that it r works better and if you do have to solder it, it will always break when the solder stops. Mechanical <coughs> <coughs> Mechanics have no influence on, ele on electronics. Um, as soon as long as there is space there won't be a problem with mechanical things. Well, if there is a if a current no if a tension mechanical tension is introduced it will have a certain influence particularly on highly precise components um, the uh, reference voltage source um, that uh, changes with a few bits of your expensive ADC if you if you um, bend your board so um, you should avoid that it's not very easy to to use uh, certain slits, slits to reduce the re reduce tension. tension. Yeah, I've never had an ESD problem. Well, I've had lots of them. ESD damage uh, are cumulative, so they may not actually attack the chip and simply destroy it. Uh, maybe just only after 10 attacks it'll get worse and then break for eventually. Um, uh, well, if my circuit has 8 kilovolts ESD rating, well, yes, it may have that, but this is after the human body model, um, which unfortunately is not always enough. Uh, the whole group of components will have 
uh, to be valued with somewhat different criteria. You need more protecting components. Um, over voltage uh, protection, well, the integrated diodes will not look after that because in most cases they are simply not specified. The makers will not guarantee how much these will bear. So as a responsible developer, you should not expect uh, that to work and, and add external protection components. Right. I have kind of worked through everything. Last myth, the classic, we've always done it this way. Who has never heard that one? Right. Meanwhile, we have new components. We have price pressure. We have um, EMP uh, regulations. Um, so we've always done it this way. Simply is no argument to keep doing it this way. Now, the new bullshit is called right on the first try. It can only come from someone who's never done it. Uh, these people then claim, well, with the simulation tools, we can get it right on the first try. Well, yes, it could be done if you massively over-design things uh, and do not use innovative solutions, and actually it doesn't quite work. So, next one. Products are simply rebuilds of demo boards, and the developers simply drink coffee. No, they don't. Demo boards are c quite badly suitable to, to be rebuilt and sold because they have a completely different purpose. They are just to, there to uh, present your own chip in a favorable light uh, and not to create a product that is actually ready to be sold. So some reference boards, reference designs, demo boards, simply have errors. Right. Uh, now I will have to thank some of my former colleagues. I haven't, I couldn't manage to all to do all mistakes myself. Some of my former colleagues and current colleagues. KiCad is a great tool, but it needs some more development, and will be very grateful for some support. And. I have to thank my PCB designer who did all my graphics and uh, any programmers uh, are very welcome. I have a few interesting products to share with you. So at the end, don't do any stupid things with your knowledge. No war tools, no toys, uh, no surveillance technology. Let the other ones do that. Thank you. Great. I can't, I don't have to throw him off the stage. Do you have any questions? Yes, please. Okay. What is your approach if you have and you have a problem when you have a problem and don't know how to find it yeah drink coffee that depends a lot on intuition is a bit steep uh, usually you assume where the problem where the components might be critical so if a device has error potential i always try to put in uh, uh, resistors in there so i can choose different parts of the um, device at different times so if you use a thermal t uh, camera properly it's usually quite helpful but you have to first take a photo of the unsupplied device and put the other one on top of that turn it on put the other oscilloscope on it sometimes you find the errors usually you find the errors usually it's good not to tell your uh, colleagues and just let him continue to work because looking at it from a different view usually helps, or a new day. Uh, okay, from the left. 
Thank you. Great talks. Thanks for the info. I would like to get some more detail for looking at it and have it next to my workplace. So are there any literature, is there any literature that you can recommend? There are the usual literature suggestions. However, most of the subjects are really distributed. They are really everywhere. I've always wanted to create a checklist. However, I have to admit that at thir certain areas, I just don't know enough about them with high power electronics. So maybe we can do something about that if someone does have time and wants to do something like that. Would be a great opportunity. The slides can be found. Try again. You have better. Um, well, the, the trap that I fell into but didn't really find a good way out of is where do I find for an IC the layout information if I do not yet know which maker I'm going to use in the final product. So if I have an IC uh, with a certain as N whatever, um, f don't know where to buy it from and every maker gives you different measures for it, for the patterns. Um, well, that's a significant issue, or not at all. The suggestions of the manufacturers, you will always have to be checked carefully. Um, I always have footprints cre and have created them and optimized them for how it works where I work. The suggestions of the manufacturers aren't always that correct, or maybe they are correct, but not appropriate for your problem. For example, you could create it and solder it, and you will notice, hey, there's a little bit too much solder, or you should reduce the uh, solder resist, and you try it and look at it and see what does change, and what gets better, and you change that in your library, and then just do the average. Why not? For the first try, that's reasonable and completely OK, I would say. Another question is creeping up. I have a question about uh, the ground areas. Uh, people say it's good to separate analog and digital parts. Other think, think it's nonsense. What do you think? Uh, no. So semiconductors create, I say, ADCs and logical mass shouldn't be connected. So for the the mass for the analog parts and the digital parts. Digital and analog parts. Put a slit in there and, and only connect it by a small bridge is the usual advice. Yes, well, you can do that. However, usually you will get more problems than you solve by that. A good hint is put in the slit, wrote as if the slit was there, but don't put any lines over the slit, and then put in a, a connected ground floor. But that isn't always valid. It depends on the case, it's different from a case to case basis. The producers from ADCs of fast are important. Connect, so some say connect the ADCs, the, uh, um, the ground just below these IC. And if you have two ICs that say, hey, connect it only under me, you don't know what to say what you do and usually it's reasonable to just use one mass there's well one gram usually there are fewer errors but sometimes it's this way sometimes other way around. usually i put one big ground but 
that depends. With critical signals, it moves in here, where does it return? Do I have to put it? have to change planes, does it have to change planes in the power bank, on the way home, I try to not have that. Usually they are not critical problems. You just put a bus on it, you just put in parallel flop signals, take, make them short. And on the back path, yeah. It's still quite difficult to separate analog and digital parts if the connections are not on the same side. It's, you have to look at it from a case-to-case -case basis, and if in doubt, try it out. Okay, any more questions? Right. That was a great talk, thank you. Please applaud to, for this great, this nice talk. Yeah, well, we've struggled. <laughs>